Hello, Mark Curry here. There are lots of words that I could use to describe our current health situation or our health crisis. Uh, weird, surreal, strange, unbelievable. But as far as our industry is concerned, the business that we call show business, the word is uncertain. None of us, performers, people who are working in the theatre backstage, front of house, people who are working in television, technicians, None of us know when we will be working again. And those of us who don't know when we're working again, but who are lucky enough to have some financial security, can get through this period. But there are lots of people who are not quite so fortunate. And right now is a very difficult time for them. So I wanted to do my bit. And I'm putting together a series of conversations called Conversations with Mark Curry, with some famous faces, some of them mates, some people that you'll know, I'm sure, just chatting to them about their lives, their careers, what they're doing now, their plans on hold because of this situation. And it would be great if you could enjoy those interviews and those conversations, but what would be really wonderful would be if at the end of watching those conversations, you could hit the donate button and just give whatever you can, which would really help performers, workers in theatre and television who are going through this very, very difficult time. So it's really easy. Sit back, enjoy it. And then when you finish watching, just go to the Acting for Others website, hit the donate button, and you'll be taken immediately to the Just Giving page. It's really simple. Just give as little or as much as you can. Thanks so much for watching. My conversation today is with an actress whose credits include Twelfth Night at the National Theatre in London, Macbeth at the Globe. Recently, she starred alongside Clive Owen in the London production of The Night of the Iguana, and she played the leading role in Pack of Lies at the Many a Chocolate Factory. Her films include Gosford Park and The Importance of Being Earnest, and she's even created the role for the voice for the animated version of Angelina Ballerina. She is the daughter of the late great actor Michael Williams and the currently great Dame Judi Dench. She is Finty Williams. Welcome. Oh, it's so lovely to be here and it's so lovely to see you. It's great to see you too. And in this current situation, we are allowed to go out a little bit more. The, the absolute lockdown has stopped. But how's it been for you so far, this situation? Um, well, we've been in London. My boyfriend, Joe, was in a play at the Monier Chocolate Factory, which opened on the 13th of March. Uh, and they did two previews, uh, which I was lucky enough to see the first one. And it was utterly extraordinary. And uh, on the Sunday, which was about four or five days before the rest of the West End got to sort of um, deal with it all, uh, they were told that somebody in their cast had contracted Corona. Oh, wow. So they were shut down immediately. So we were all advised, Joe and myself and my son Sam, were all advised to self-isolate. So we did. Um, and we're in the middle of London. We're in Stockwell. We are lucky enough to have a garden. But thank God for various sort of, you know, Covent Garden market vegetable people who delivered huge boxes of vegetables to us. Um, and, and all those people who deliver groceries. We were able to self-isolate for, I think, I think it was about six weeks we did it. Which is a long time to be together, isn't it, really? It was a really long time. And, and we realised quite quickly that we had to sort of go to our various rooms and do our own thing during the day. But then I, th I said it was really important that we all came together in the evening and, and have supper together and talk about how we feel. Because, you know, it's, it's one thing for how I felt about it. I wasn't currently working. I didn't have a job. Uh, Joe, obviously his job had been cancelled really abruptly um, what, and, and what was going to be an amazing job for him as well. Mm. And then there's Sammy, who's 22, who suddenly had landed a great teaching assistant job and felt really secure in who he was and what he was doing. And suddenly the rug was pulled away from under his feet. And so, you know, I, I realised quite quickly that it was really important for us to have a a really sort of open dialogue about everything we were feeling. And I said to Joe, you know, we all have our various tolerances of each other and just like any family do. 
but we just had to widen the circle just a bit more to take in sort of any irrational feelings that people were were going through yeah the, the, i've got a godson who's about the same age as sammy i know that sammy's met him oliver and uh, i've been talking to him on on facetime and, and whatsapp and he is just missing that contact with with his mates because i think as you get older you can sort of cope with a bit of isolation being on your own but when you're that age you really do want to bounce off all your mates of the same age don't you yeah and and i think i think the older you get the, the more full your life feels with past experiences, you know. Uh, but, but I think when you're 22, I think those are all such informative times and festivals and lads' holidays and, and, and all of those kind of things, which, which when you get to the ripe old age of... <laughs> um, you know, you can, you can look back on those things and you've formed very lasting friendships. Yeah. But, but I think that's really tough. I think it's really tough when you're in your early 20s. Yeah. So what about you? What is it? Para Cressida Francis. Yeah. Finti. So where did the Finti come from? As was, was Finti added on or is Finti at the end of Tara Cressida Francis? No, it's not, which makes it really confusing, you know, when you're dealing with doctors or banks or passport <laughs> people or anything like that. Or any, In fact, if people phone up and say, is Tara Williams there? I always go, no, she's not. Can I ask what this is in reference to? <laughs> and then they normally tell me I'm overdrawn or something like that. And I can say that I'll pass it on to her. <laughs> um, but uh, no. So my mother, when she was pregnant, was, in her own words, pregnant from the neck downwards. <laughs> and they were, <laughs> they were convinced that they were going to have a boy and they were going to call him Finn. Uh, and when I was born my dad said to my mum, Jude, it's not Finn, it's Finty. But then I think it was Norman Rodway who said, you must give her a proper name as well. Um, and he came up with the name Tara. I think it was Norman Rodway. Right. Uh, and, and so, yeah, Tara Cressida Francis. But Go Finty, figure. when people always say to me, Finty, what, what does Finty mean? Never heard of Finty, which is, it's lovely to have that lovely, unique, unusual name. It, yeah, it's, it's, I, I love it. And, and what I really love is that thanks to Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all of those things, I'm getting messages from people saying, oh, my name's Finty. I never knew where it came from. And you think, well, that's really nice. That was my dad's sort of legacy that other people, because when I was growing up, there was a horse called Finty and there was a chicken called Finty. And those were the only other two, two objects that had my name. <laughs> I always think, I do think that, that one year in Crufts, they're suddenly going to come up with some kind of breed of giant poodle that's called the Finty. I think, I think, it's, I think it would be quite sort of, you know, I think it'd be quite appropriate. Yeah. And I could see you going through those hoops and jumping over those fences. You could do it. Yeah, mate. I'd do it like a shot. <laughs> <laughs> so you were born in 1972. So Thanks for that. Yeah. yeah well, you know, it's all there. It's all there. <laughs> in, in 1972, was your dad, Michael Williams, and your mom, Judy Dench, already very, very well established? They were very well established equally uh, with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, I mean, obviously, they'd worked a huge amount before that, but I think that was a sort of golden time for the RSC. I think, I think they'd been there for like 10 and 12 years, respectively, at that point. Um, so we lived in a house just outside Stratford with all my grandparents, and we had a house in London. So we split our time between the two things. But yeah, they were very much, they were very much on a level at that point. And do you remember the first time you saw... Either of them on stage? Uh, I probably, I, I remember being backstage at the RSC a lot. Like, as it was, it's all changed now. But as it was, I remember being backstage there. The first time I really remember seeing them, I think I, think I was about four. And yeah. they did a production, a musical production of Comedy of Errors. And my dad played one of the Dromeos and my mum played Adriana. And Roger Reese was in it and Nick Grace and Francesca Annis and like amazing, amazing, amazing people. And I always remember at the end 
I can remember what I was wearing. I was four years old. I was wearing a tartan dress. And my dad, they sang this beautiful song at the end called We Will Go Hand in Hand. And, and it sort of all sort of petered out and people would get up on the stage and dance. And my dad came out at the end and he came down into the audience and he picked me up and he took me back onto the stage and he said, go away, away. And that was the first time I was on stage, so. And you can remember all that. And of course, one imagines that being in that situation, that theatrical situation, one, one imagines that at home it was, it was colourful characters, the house was full of life and full of drama and comedy and, and everything. Was it, was it like that? I don't, I don't really remember it being anything other than, uh, you know, my, because we lived with my grandparents, so yeah. uh, it, it was very... <laughs> they used to have some holding as a rouse, um, mainly over things like kettles and irons and things like that and how to cook roast potatoes. Um, but I had my best friend, Emma, who lived five minutes up the road. And I remember summers spent with her. And I do remember going into the theatre and meeting amazing people, but I never remember it particularly translating to home. It was always very stable and calm and and it always seemed to be the summer. Always. Really, that's interesting, isn't it? Because I was, I was thinking the other day that when you look back at school holidays, it always seemed to be long, hot, yeah. sunny days. And it probably yeah. wasn't, but it, it seems like it is currently now. Yeah. I never remember a summer where it was like, bleh. Yeah, yeah. But then I suppose we lived through the summer of 76, so I remember that being very hot. Yeah, that went on forever. So as a child, did you already think, I want to do this, I want to be up there, I want to be on that stage, it's magical? Did you think that? <clears throat> no, I think, according to my mother, I wanted to be an acrobatic nurse. Because, <laughs> because you know those things, you know those things they used to have above beds for people who'd broken their legs or yeah. something? Like a, a thing that you pulled yourself up on. Yeah. I think I thought that I could sort of go and do trapeze type type stuff on all of those things. I don't think the nursing came into it particularly. So there was obviously some kind of artistic input even then. Uh, trapeze artist, that didn't last for very long. Uh, dancer lasted a very long time. Did it? Yeah, I really wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be a ballet dancer. Very badly. Okay. But, but you can imagine that some kids born into that situation might just say, I don't want this. I do not want this. I want to go. But you, you embraced it and you ended up going to drama school. You went to Central. Yeah. So obviously by then you'd, you'd really decided that's, that's what you want to do. Yes, I had. I think, I think once, once, the, once the dream of being a dancer had gone, which was A, I was probably not good enough, and B, I sort of hit that time where people like Darcy Bustle and Sylvie Guillem and Viviana Durante and people like that started coming along who were like six foot two on point and I'm a hobbit. Uh, so I probably wouldn't have even hit much above five foot two on point. Um, not many parts for those people. Uh, I think once, once I realized that had gone, I think, I don't remember. I don't remember like a, a point in my life where I was like, yes, this is what I want to do. I don't remember that. It was just, it was literally just something that happened. It was just there. But you went to Central, as I said. So, so did your parents say, if you want this or you want to try this, it's a really good idea to try keen on training or was that your decision? They said, if you want to do it, you have to train. Um, I don't remember them saying, this is a bad idea. I, th mm, I, think, I think maybe if it had happened a couple of years later, I think maybe somebody might have sat down and gone, you're going to spend an awful lot of your time being compared to your mother. But by that point, she hadn't done the Bond films or anything like that. 
I kind of wish somebody had. I don't know whether it would have stopped me. Um, <laughs> I don't think it probably would. Um, but I decided to do musical theatre at Central because it is my biggest, hugest, most all-encompassing passion. And at the time, I figured, <laughs> however stupidly, that uh, it was something that my mother probably hadn't uh, succeeded that much in. She'd done Cabaret in 1968, that was before I was born. She was cast as the original Grisabella in Cats in 1982, I think, but then had pulled out of that. But it was always sort of known in our house that she couldn't sing. Right. And I, I think there was part of me that thought, oh, okay, so this is an avenue that I could pursue that maybe hasn't been covered by other members of my family. Yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> because she's done everything. She's done absolutely everything. And so have you, practically, by the way. Um, yeah, well, my final, my final show at Central was uh, a, a musical that my mother had never seen called The Little Night Music. Go figure. Yeah. Uh, and, and six months later, she, I think it was about six months later, nine months later, something like that. She, of course, made it definitive and iconic and she's a wonder. And were you, were you okay with that? Because when you're older, you, you don't have the, the envy or the, any of that going on, but, but were there, was there ever a time when, you know, she went and got something like that and you thought, but I want to do that. That's, that's what I want to do. Um, n no, because I, I, I just think she's amazing. And she was, she was very dear about Little Night Music. Uh, I remember I, I went down to their house. I was doing a show in town and I went down to their house afterwards. And she took me out into the garden and she said, I've been offered this musical at the National. Um, but if it's your thing, then I won't do it. And, and of course, I mean, you know, she, she is incredible at whatever she does. And why should I be the person that goes, actually, no, I, I'm going to be really selfish about the whole thing. This is my thing. Yeah, you know, you can't do that. Yeah. You do you think do you think it opened doors for you that you were the daughter of Judy Dench and the daughter of Michael Williams? Do you think it opened doors? I think that it introduced me to some people who have been really influential in my life, like Bill Kenwright. I don't know whether I would have met him. Had I not, I, I don't know, I don't know. I've always said, you know, it's very difficult if, if you're the son or daughter of somebody and, you know, said director comes round for Sunday lunch and you sit and you talk to them and then six weeks later, you've got an audition with them. It's, it's, it's very hard to bridge that gap between knowing them socially and, and then them having the ability to see you as something different. Yeah. I always remember I, um, I found out that Peter Hall was directing Bedroom Farce, which is a play that we did together, uh, and one of my favourite plays of all time. Yeah. And I got my agent to call him and say, Finty really wants to audition for this. And he said, no, she can't do that. I know, I know what she's capable of. She can't do that. Um, and I begged, I'm afraid. <laughs> I begged. And, and I got the part, which was really nice. But I think, I think there, is that, there is that limitation. But, but, but why do you think he said, no, she can't do that? Maybe because he saw the part being played by somebody else. You know, maybe he saw her being a five foot 11, blonde, skinny 21 year old. Yeah. And this I is the part of Kate. In seven and as I say, a hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> and what about people wanting to get to know you because they know that they think that maybe through you they could get to meet the great Judy Dench. Do, are, are you aware of that? Does that happen? Has that ever happened? Oh yes, it's happened a lot. Yeah. Um, 
I, th I think I'm slightly more aware of it. Mm. I was very ignorant about it for a very long time. Um, I still find it hard. I still find it peculiar. And I find it hard when good friends of mine go, oh my God, I'm going to meet Judy Dench. And you go, no, you're going to meet my mum. <laughs> it's just my mum. It's mum. You know, but I think it's a lesson that Sammy has learned much quicker than me. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but people are turned on by fame, Finty. They, they really are. Yeah. Okay. Me too. Well, yeah, of course. Of course. And it is difficult when you, you suddenly meet somebody and, and you've been, and you've watched them and you admire them. It's very different if actually you don't admire them. But when you meet somebody socially and, you know, you do go, wow, I'm, I'm actually spending some, some private time with this with this this legend person you know i mean the only thing i mean I, there are certain people who who you know i i've not been able to utter a sentence to pierce brosnan i couldn't speak to him i couldn't speak to him for about five years <laughs> i i was just so sort of blown away by him um cheetah rivera I sobbed. I, I cried so hard when I met Chita Rivera that I had to turn to Joe and say, you tell her that I'm completely in awe of her. And then I went, <laughs> I went to a meet and greet with RuPaul's drag queens. And I cried. I sobbed. I met Kennedy Davenport and I met Latrice Royale. Mm -hmm. And I sobbed. So I completely get it. I understand it. Totally. And, and I, and I, and I would h hate to ever not have that feeling. But some, sometimes it's just a little weird when it's people you've known for, for quite a long time. Yeah. And then you start thinking, oh, okay, so you're friendly with me because you want, I get it. And that, that must be a bit disappointing. The only thing I would say is that when, when I first met you and, and, and started to work with you, the only thing that threw me when we first started rehearsing, we were doing bedroom farce at, at Windsor for, yeah. for building Light, and we were playing husband and wife. Really? I remember sometimes looking at you and, and, and I could see and hear your dad and then I could see and hear your mom. And then I saw you. And for the first few days, I remember saying to friends, it, she's, she's fantastic, but I can see a bit of Michael because Michael was such a, such a, well, a wonderful actor, but a wonderful comedic actor. Genius, genius mm. comedy actor. And I could see all these things, as you often can when you look at children of, of, of parents, you can see all the different bits going on. And that, that threw me for, for a few days. <laughs> but you are undoubtedly you, no doubt about it. Um, I mentioned when I was introducing you that uh, the last year at the Many a Chocolate Factory, you, you played the lead in Pack of Lies. This was a role that was created for your mother, well, well the husband and wife, for your mother and father. Uh, years ago, written by Hugh Whitemore. Yeah. So how did that happen, that you were playing the same role that your mother had created? I was li I literally sitting at home uh, in July, two years ago, uh, no work, and my agent phoned and said, the Many a Chocolate Factory, who I'd auditioned for, for quite a few things in the past, and I'd never got any of them, and I really, really like it there please God, it survives this virus. Um, and she phoned up and she said, you've had an offer from them, which as we know is incredibly rare, incredibly rare, unless you're sort of upper echelons of the business. And I thought it was to play because there are two police women in it who have sort of two or three scenes each. And I thought it was to play one of them. And she said, it's to play Barbara Jackson. Uh, and I, I think I did three things. I shrieked, I burst into tears, and then the pit of my stomach fell out, um, all at the same time. Yeah. Uh, because I remember it very, very clearly. I remember I was eight when they did it, uh, and I remember it being an just, extraordinary just, play. Just reminders of the story for those people who haven't seen that that play. So it's about uh, Barbara and Bob Jackson in the 60s. They're a very working class couple who have a daughter. They live in Ryslip. Their best friends are two Canadians who live across the road um, called Helen and Peter. 
and one day they get approached by a police officer. It's all true as well. They get approached by a police officer who tells them that they want to put a policewoman in their daughter's bedroom upstairs to uh, work a sort of surveillance thing for the area. He won't tell them what they're looking for. He won't uh, sort of elaborate on it, but he also will not tell them who they're looking for. It subsequently turns out that they're spying on their best friends who turn out to be KGB spies. In fact, Helen Kroger was a colonel in the KGB. So it's a story about betrayal and friendship and uh, trust. And it's the most extraordinary play. And I, I genuinely, you know, if, if, if whatever happens after this lockdown, if, if it means I never do another play again, I feel unbelievably proud that I did it. Although it was an utterly terrifying thing to take on. I bet it was. Yeah. And of course, the many a chocolate factory, it's uh, for those people who haven't been, you know, you are, you are very close to the stage. It's absolutely magical. And on your first night, I don't think it was your preview night, or it may have been actually your very, very- It was, it was, what, when you came? Yes. First preview. <laughs> first preview. Yeah. Uh, we came in and I, and I was sat next to your mum. And um, she was a nervous wreck. She really genuinely was. She wasn't doing the whole, oh, I'm nervous for what. She really was um, quietly nervous. But, uh, but the reason I knew was because she, she, I had her sort of, she was on my right and I had her left leg just constantly banging into mine throughout the whole show. And a little bit of rocking was going on like this. <laughs> Which of course made me rock as well. <laughs> I really wanted her to move by act two because I thought I can't cope with this. because No, was I wouldn't have been there. I'd have told her to leave. <laughs> I think it was also, I think for Ma, it was, because uh, I remember when we were rehearsing, there was a bit of it that I phoned her. And I don't normally ask her advice about things, but I phoned her and I said, how did you do this bit? What did this mean to you? And she said, darling, I can't remember a single word of it. Well, of course she can't, because she's done more plays than you can shake a stick at. Um, but I think the reason she was, because I didn't know that she was at that preview, she was supposed to be coming to the first night and I didn't know, um, Joan knew. Uh, but I think it was, it was so much to do with the fact that, that my dad had been so amazing in it. Yeah. And I think it was because the person who played my husband was Chris Larkin, who is Maggie Smith's son, who we've known for such a long time. So, and Jasper Britton was in it, Tony Britton's son, and Ma had been great friends with Tony Britton. And I think it was a lot to do with facing that um, memory of my father, much more so than whatever I was doing. Yeah. I mean, she was probably a bit nervous about that. I would have been. It was a heck of a role. And what did Evening Standard say? I've got it written down here. A performance of unflagging strength. Wow. That was just one of the great reviews that you got because uh, you know I was nervous about that I was I was nervous that maybe some critics who'd seen your mom do it would start comparing and all that and none of that happened me too it me was too. yours it was totally yours absolutely well uh, it was a huge privilege to do it huge and one that I will genuinely never forget I could do it probably every single night in rep with bedroom fast with you for the rest of my life <laughs> That would do for me. I'd be very happy with it as well. Yeah, I think we'd be okay. <laughs> the one thing you are, apart from being terrific on stage, is you're, you're a great company member. You really are. It is, it is like a family and you make sure everybody's happy. And, and, and when I say everybody, I don't just mean people on stage. You know, you're very aware of, of it being a team effort. And that's, that's just inherent in you. And, and I, I gather that, that, that your mum is, is exactly the same. Yeah. Completely. And she's amazing. She's amazing. She, she, you know, it, she, she's always been asked whether or not she'd do a one woman show. And she said, why would I? Because for her, it's about the people. And for me, it's about the people. And, and, you know, I, but I have to say that being, being a good company member, I learned a lot of that from you because you are probably the greatest company member. You're like, Hugh Jackman in The Greatest Showman. I mean, you're like, you're like, you know, you should be running about in a red jacket singing songs. <laughs> well, I am usually here. Well, normally, actually, to be perfectly fair. 
<laughs> but you know, the quizzes and the, the just keeping everybody sort of on top and, 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 and reminding people how lucky we are to be doing the job. Yeah. So. But you know, one, one story I remember, we were doing a play and, and you had a lot to do. We were doing a, a farce, a Ray Cooney farce called Move Over Mrs. Markham and you were Mrs. Mm. Markham. You, you never stopped in the play, you were racing about on and off a lot, just physical, physical as, 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 as well as mental. And you came off uh, after act one and you immediately went and made this flask of tea. And I thought, why is she making herself a flask of tea? She's got a- Let's do it. And you were making it for the guy in the car park at the mill at Sonning who actually looks after all the cars. Yeah. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm making this for Stuart. It was the first thing you were doing. You know, that's, that's, that says a lot about you, I think. No, he was standing outside in the pouring rain. We were all on stage having a bit of a laugh. You know, the other people have, mu have it much harder than, than we do. We, ha we were just having a really nice time. I laughed more in that play on stage than I think any other play I've ever done. In fact, I think I've laughed more on stage with you <laughs> and tell me Thomas, who is an actor in Move Over Mrs. Markham, yeah. than I have with anybody, any other two people in my life, I think. And you know, as, as wonderful as that is to laugh with somebody on stage, it's also terrible because, you know, you try and keep in it, you try and keep in character, but you look at somebody and there's a little thing, and it doesn't happen with everybody, but there's just something, you look, you look at certain people and it's you terrible. just... And I'm really susceptible to that. I'm really bad. I'm sure I have a terrible reputation for that. Do you, do you help your mum with, with um, choosing projects? Does she come to you for advice on stuff? Not really. She, she gets... Uh, either a director or her agent or uh, a writer to tell her the story um, and if she likes the sound of it then then she goes ahead and does it she can't see anymore very well so reading scripts is a bit out of the question um, but she has a pretty good instinct yeah so there's nothing that's come along that she said no to and you said, Mom, you must do this. Or the other way around, you know, she wanted to do something and you said, Mom, don't touch it. That <coughs> uh, not, not that I can remember. I remember when she was offered M in the Bond films. Uh, I think because filming at that point was, was not something she felt confident in at all. Um, and I totally understand because I'm not very good at it either. Um, and, and I think she probably would have turned that down, but my father sat up all night convincing her to do it, mainly because he wanted to be able to go to the pub and say that he was married to a Bond girl. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so sweet. The, the premiere of Goldeneye, we were all sitting in the cinema in Leicester Square and and that amazing Tina Turner song started playing. And my father just started crying. And he cried and cried and cried. <laughs> he was so proud of her. <laughs> he loved it. You followed up uh, your performance at the Chocolate Factory with um, The Night of the Iguana with, with Clive Owen. Yeah. So that you were terrific. It was a terrific production. It was a steamy production. That's the word I would use. You really could feel the heat and the and the sweat and the, you know, that that intense atmosphere. I, I thought it was terrific. What was that like for you? Oh, it was amazing. It was an amazing play. But I mean, you know, when you're rehearsing, you go in for your first day of rehearsal because essentially it's a play about three people who are played by Clive Owen, Leah Williams and Anna Gunn who famously was in Breaking Bad. Um, luckily or unluckily, at that point, I hadn't seen Breaking Bad, uh, but I knew how accomplished she was and how extraordinary she was. Uh, so they'd all been called, I think, in the middle of May, and we were all called from the beginning of June. And I remember walking into the first day of rehearsal, and my first scene was with Clive Owen and Anna Garn. And I was like, I, what am I doing here? What am I doing? I, you know, these are two like filmic stalwarts of actors who I've seen in so many things. You know, I'd seen Anna in all sorts of things. And that, that was quite hard. 
that was quite tricky. But James McDonald, who directed it, there were, there were along with those three, there was Julian Glover. And they had the sort of mammoth bit of that play to do. But then there were, I think, 11 other actors in it. Um, and he made everybody feel as important as everybody else. And if you wanted to ask a question, you were never sort of, you know, Clive and Leah and Anna were never prioritized in that. And he, he, I said to him, he was like, I said, it's like you've got a mountain of champagne glasses all balanced on top of each other. And you've positioned them so brilliantly that when you pour the champagne into the top one, then every single other glass gets filled. And it was genuinely one of the happiest experiences because of that. And actually, we're all still we're all still in contact because we have a fancy dress party every Sunday via Zoom. Oh, that's <laughs> nice! Oh, that's great. You're still in contact. That that says a lot, actually, because often you do shows and you all go different ways. And... Exactly. That's it. It was a short run. How how long was it? Twelve weeks. Twelve weeks. Yeah. Which is quite nice, isn't it? Oh yeah, I'd happily be in something for like a year. Would you? Okay. Oh yes, right, I'd right. love it. I'd really love it. I love the, I love being in the theatre. I love being with a group of people. I love having that time to get to know a group of people, um, and and get to know a play and on the routine of it. I'd love that. I'd love that more than I could say. So is that what you'd like to do? Is that what you're putting out there? You want to do a long run? Yeah. A year at least in town or on the road? Maybe a bit on the road and then in town. I'm not fussy. <laughs> you know what, mate? After this, I'll take anything I can get. I think we yeah. all will. I think we all will. We I don't. think, you know. And, and what about film and telly? I know you've done some. Would you, would you like to do more? I'm not very good at film and telly. Um, Why do you say that? It terrifies me because there's something about going on stage where you can be anybody you want to be. So you put a costume on and you have your wig put on or not, or you put makeup on. And when you step out on stage, in my head, I can be five foot 11 and I don't have to suffer with any of the things that are going on with me at that point. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I think with film and television, I, I find something quite intrusive about it. I find it, um, I, I think, I have a fear that people, people will get to know too much about me. <laughs> um, and, and You mean by watching you, by, by, by you being so close, is that what you mean? I think so. I think it's, I think, I think, I, I think inherently I'm quite, I'm quite frightened about getting older. I'm quite, I, you know, I'm, I'm in denial about the fact that, you know, four foot 11 and a half and not, you know, a size six. I think all those things are quite are quite present if I really think about them. It's gone a bit deep, hasn't it? Um, right. But on stage, I don't have that feeling. I don't. I don't. I don't feel that um, pressure. Yeah. Also, it's that journey thing, isn't it? I, I mean, I've done very little tele acting, but the bits I have done, you arrive, you've learned your scenes for that day and they say to you, actually, we can't do those scenes because it's raining or because that person hasn't turned up. So we're going to do the end scene, you know, where you break down or something. And you, on stage, you get that build up to, to yeah. the breakdown. You know, I really admire so much film and, and, and tele actors who can just, just do it. And particularly things like soaps where it's fast, you, it's instant, you've got to turn it on there and then. I, I take my hat off to each and every one of them. I always remember my friend Casey Ainsworth, who I was at Central with, who played Little Mo in EastEnders. Mm. Uh, when she was in the midst of all of that, she said that on a Sunday, she got given seven scripts that she had to learn. Now, I don't, I, I don't have that ability. I learn by repetition. Um, uh, so I think, that, I think that frightens me a bit. But, but I just, I think to be able to encompass a character and 
and you know convey so much about it with those type those kind of time constraints i think is is an extraordinary ability extraordinary i guess you would say that your finest production is sam sammy your son was there ever a time when when he was showing signs of wanting to perform or not no no, no not at all he was the person in the nativity play when he came on as a shepherd <laughs> I always remember he had the obligatory tea towel, you know, in the dressing gown and all the little children were standing there and, you know, they'd spot their mummies and they'd wave and things like that. And Sammy, literally, I'm not, I'm not joking. So if you're the audience, Sammy stood like this. <laughs> Wouldn't look at anybody. Um, no, he's never, he's never, he's passionate about the theatre. He is passionate about musicals. Knows he had, a, he had an interview with, um, a very renowned director, West End and Broadway director, just recently about work, made the possibility of working for him in a sort of media capacity. And this director then phoned my mother afterwards and said, your grandson knows more about the West End and Broadway than I do. Uh, he's extraordinary. He's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, I was teaching him musicals from the age of about four. Uh, so he can sing about, oh, I don't know, about 60 musicals all the way through. But um, no, he's never wanted to do it. He's now, he's now, during lockdown, flourished in the whole great TikTok world. I don't really understand what that means. But uh, yeah, I think he topped a million viewers or something last week. So that's extraordinary. Because he got your mum to do some stuff as well. I, I switched on the local news here. And they were doing they were doing some some gags. She was in isolation, and, and, and yeah, and, yeah. He he got her. He taught her one of the dances, um, and subsequently he was on like the the biggest Australian radio program. It was shown on the morning show in the states. It was on telly in Spain. It was like you know. So suddenly he's gone stratospheric. So hopefully that will be fine. And when I you know, when and if I ever get another job, he can keep me in the manner I'm accustomed. <laughs> or not, as the case may be. <laughs> yeah. Well, Finty, we're going through weird times, as you know, that, and the reason we're doing this is, is for performers and people who work in theatre, you know, technicians and, and people who work in the box office, everything, everybody involved with industry. Uh, particularly the ones who are having a bad time right now. And that's the reason you've given up your time today and I'm giving up my time. So um, I know that we wish them well, don't we? We really do. Just um, massively, massively. We've all just got to cling on. And, you know, if we think of, if we think of the whole of our industry as a sort of giant arc, we're all on it together and we all just have to hold on to each other. We're all in quite literally in the same boat. Um, and we, we have to look out for the people who we think are, you know, uh, in, in maybe on their own or, you know, aren't near family or, or don't have the ability to Zoom or FaceTime because of an inability to grasp the, the whole technology thing. We just have to look out for those people, but we have to just hang on to each other because that way, However, the theatres start up again, they have to start up again because, because we know how vital they can be for people. Yeah. Um, and we love watching theatre as well as, as, as much as, well, not, maybe not, not quite as much as we <laughs> I really I, I've missed going to the theatre. I really have, because when I'm not working, I love to go and see other, other people doing stuff. You know, that inspires me and, I, and, I'm, and I'm really missing that. But, uh, you know, we're... We're lucky that financially we're kind of okay, but there are a lot of people who are, who are really not, and, it, and it's and it's 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 a worrying time. So I want to thank you so much for oh, for doing this, and it's just it's been, been really lovely to speak to you. <laughs> it's been great to talk to you, and please, everybody watching this, if you've enjoyed this chat, hit the donate button uh, and just give whatever you can, however little, however much, just uh, just give what you can if you want to. Thanks a lot, and thank you to Finty. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching that conversation. If you've enjoyed it, please go to the Acting for Others website, which is actingforothers.co.uk 
and hit the donate button, which will take you immediately to the Just Giving page. And please give as little or as much as you possibly can to help those performers and people in the industry who really need your help financially right now. Thanks a lot.